professor of the public understanding of science, not professor of delivering truth to the public. And these are two different exercises. One of them is you put the truth out there, and like you said, they either buy your book or they don't. Well, that's not being an educator. That's just putting it out there. Being an educator is, part, is not only getting the truth right, but there's got to be an act of persuasion in there as well. Persuasion isn't always, here's the facts, you're either an idiot or you're not. It's, it's here are the facts, and here, is, and here is a sensitivity to your state of mind, and it's the facts plus the sensitivity, when convolved together, creates impact. And I worry that your, your methods and your, your, your how, how, how articulately barbed you can be ends up simply being ineffective yeah. when, when you have much more power of influence than what is currently reflected in your output. I gratefully accept the rebuke. Um, <laughs> um, I, just just one, one anecdote to show that I'm not the worst in this thing. Um, a, um, a former and highly successful editor of New Scientist magazine, who actually built up New Scientist to great new heights, was asked, what is your philosophy at New Scientist? And he said, our philosophy at New Scientist is this. Science is interesting, and if you don't agree, you can fuck off. <laughs> Do you think there could be one sentence that could convince, um, let's say, a creationist to seriously doubt their theory? Ideally, if you could convince a believer in God to really doubt their belief, but that's too hard. Not sure about a, about a sentence. I think perhaps the single most convincing fact, the observation that you could point to, would be the, um, the pattern of resemblances that you see when you compare the genes using modern DNA techniques, actually looking at the letter-to-letter -letter correspondences between genes, compare the genes of any pair of animals you like, uh, pair of animals, pair of plants, and then plot out the resemblances and they fall on a perfect hierarchy, a perfect family tree. And the only alternative to it being a family tree is that the intelligent designer deliberately set out to deceive us in the most underhand and devious manner. Um, <laughs> more, moreover, the same thing works with, with every gene you do separately and even pseudogenes that don't do anything but are vestigial relics of genes that once, that once did something. I find it extremely hard to imagine how any creationist who actually bothered to listen to that could possibly doubt the fact of evolution. But they don't listen. I mean, there's, there's, your, your question is a, is a perfectly good question, but it's not, it's not really relevant because what they do is simply stick their fingers in their ear and say, la, la, la. They know what's true because it's in the holy book. And that, that even, I mean, the most extreme case is the geologist Kurt Wise, who has a PhD in geology from Harvard, and said, if all the evidence in the universe pointed towards an old earth, I would be the first to admit it, but I would still be a young earth creationist because that is what Holy Scripture teaches me. You cannot argue with, 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 a, with, a, with a mind like that. A mind like that, it seems to me, is, well, a disgrace to the human species. <laughs>
So I think there is a genetic tendency to behave in some sort of a way which you might call religious. I prefer to say that it's a psychological predisposition which often manifests itself in the form of religion but doesn't necessarily have to. And there could be a whole collection of psychological predispositions which together, collectively, uh, lead to religious belief. Things like obedience to authority. And you could easily imagine a genetic basis for obedience to authority which might actually have a Darwinian survival value. It might actually benefit, perhaps especially children, to believe what their parents tell them, what their authoritative elders of the tribe tell them. Because if they don't, they might um, do something dangerous, like, you know, walk into a fire or over a cliff or something. Um, so a genetic tendency to, um, to have a psychological predisposition to believe authority, there might be other ones as well. That's the kind of thing that could manifest itself as religious belief under the right conditions. After all, a child who's been told to do something sensible, like don't pick up snakes, um, the, the rule of thumb that, that's actually genetically coded for wouldn't be don't pick up snakes. It would be believe your parents. And, if you, and the rule of thumb that says believe your parents would have no way of distinguishing good advice like don't pick up snakes. From, from silly advice or time-wasting advice like, you know, kneel down and pray to the great god of the mountains five times a day or something. Well, do you think that religious belief has, has anything to do with survival? I think that the psychological predispositions that have led to religion, like obedience to authority, do have something to do with survival, yes. Whether religion itself has something to do with survival, I don't know. Uh, it might have, but that, of course, wouldn't make it true. Uh, it would just be an interesting fact. Uh, you've, you've done debates all around the world. Have you ever had a, I guess, a clever or a interesting argument from the other side? No. 